1975, the Soviet Air Force commissioned the Tupolev Bureau to design a fourth-generation strategic weapons system to rival the American B-52 bomber. The aircraft was required to carry various bombs and missiles, to have intercontinental range, and be capable of supersonic speed at high altitude. The maiden flight of the Tu-160 took place on the 18th of December 1981 and officially entered into the Soviet Union service in 1987. Hi there and welcome to our channel. We invite you to sit back and relax as you join us on another exciting model building adventure. And this is a big one. <laughs> The kit features Trumpeter's 72 scale version of the enormous Tupolev 160 heavy strategic bomber with the ironic NATO reporting name of Blackjack because to the Russians it's more fondly referred to as the White Swan. Let's take a closer look at what is inside the box. Trumpeter included a glossy full color fold out in the instructions which serves both as a basic color guide as well as a key to decal placement. Because the model has a fairly high parts count of 621 parts on 13 large sprue trees, the instruction booklet is quite daunting at first glance. Just 27 simple steps and the model will be done. The decals are bright and colorful and of a very good quality. The kit also contains a mysterious blue box. On opening, one discovers that it is a safe repository for the more fragile and loose bits, such as the awesome rubber tires, the super clear canopy and clear part sprue, the main components of the landing gear, which were made of metal in earlier kits, but are of a sturdy molded plastic in this one. And of course, there are other cockpit add-ons such as acetate film and photo etch details. The enormous fuselage takes some getting used to. Both of the rear fuselage sections are packed in separate bags to prevent damage during shipping. The rest of the parts are molded in light grey styrene and the surface detail is spectacular. All of the panel lines are recessed but unfortunately very shallow which is actually perfect for a 72 scale aircraft as large deeply recessed panel lines destroy the illusion of the scale. However, I struggle to enhance these shallow details even after trying various oil washers and commercial panel liners. I guess that will remain a problem to be solved some other time. That said, these small details actually do catch the light and really pop when the finished model is viewed from different angles. While there is no flash to speak of, there were some serious injector pin marks which the manufacturer attempted to remove with varying degrees of success. However, these were a minor annoyance and a great way to spend a Sunday afternoon. The parts for the four K-36 ejection seats of the flight crew were cut from their sprues and carefully assembled. There was a lot of photo etch in the flight compartment. The ejection seat handles were trimmed and fixed into place with CA glue. The rest of the photo etch was also trimmed and prepared for painting. I used reference pictures to color match the paints for the cockpit and painted all of the parts before final assembly. The included acetates looked great when positioned correctly and the small dials and instruments appeared to be behind glass once everything was glued into place. After painting the rest of the cockpit, the seats were added, along with the flight controls and instrument panels for the two pilots in the front of the cockpit, with a navigator and defense systems operator behind them. There is even a privy curtain at the rear of the flight cabin, behind which there is a latrine. Some other crew comforts are built into the cockpit for long-haul flights, including a little galley and rest area. 
There's also an electric oven for warming food and next to it, hot water for a cup of tea. The front landing gear actually forms part of the cockpit sub-assembly. The landing bay was put together and painted, as with other parts of the sub-assembly, and then everything was glued into place. The kit contains 12 KH-55 and 2 KH-55SM cruise missiles, which are housed in clusters of six on two rotary launchers in separate missile bays. Once the missiles were assembled, they were painted white, while the central part of the rotary launcher was painted with a mixture of silver and gold. These were glued into two clusters of six missiles, and each set was attached to a rotary launcher. I found it easier to paint the finer details of the missile bays while they were still on the sprue. I added an oil wash to enhance the details and dirty things up a little. The rotary launcher subunits were glued into place during the construction of the two missile bays. Next up was the engine air intake sub-assembly. I separated all the parts and painted them white as per the instructions. Actually, they do look black on the reference pictures, so I do regret this decision. The parts for the rear engine nozzles were all laid out separately and received a coat of Alclad black gloss. Part of the nozzle was painted in a dull aluminium and I did the same to the rear turbine just for some contrast. I get lost inside my thoughts and when I start to think Oh, the time how close it starts to end up on the brink I tried so hard but all these scars they cut so deep I bleed I fell so fast from heaven it's like someone clipped my wings Now I'm falling and I can't see This gravity, it keeps bringing me down. Putting the two wings together was probably the most intricate part of the build. They were magnificently detailed and had a lot of delicate parts to them. Each of the flaps were in two halves, which I carefully glued together. Next up, one needs to glue in the tabs which are used to attach the flaps and slats to the wings. On each side, there is a wing sweep pivot fitting. On the real aircraft, this part is built mostly of titanium and weighs around 6 tons. This gadget allows the model builder to position the wings as spread forward or swept back, but once their position is decided, they are permanently glued into place. The wing flaps can be glued into various positions too. I decided to glue mine in the downward position, as if the aircraft was decreasing speed in order to release its missiles. All of the slats were also in two parts and needed to be glued together before being added to the leading edge of the wings. They were very thin and fragile and difficult to work with at first, but they were accurate for the scale of the aircraft. The front and rear parts of the two fuselage halves were carefully cut and trimmed before finally gluing them together with some Tamiya thin cement. This was, of course, only the initial bond, and once this cured, I reinforced the joint with some sprue goo made from old sprues melted into styrene cement. The final sub-assemblies were the two rear landing bays. I built them up and painted them dark grey. Then came the high point of the build, combining all of the sub-assemblies to form one gigantic model aircraft. All of the parts were reinforced with sprue goo 
especially the wheel bays, which are effectively the load-bearing points of the model. Is this what giving up feels like? I don't know, I don't know. Tell me have I lost my mind? Nowhere to go, so far from home. Is this what giving up feels like? I don't know, I don't know. Tell me have I lost my mind? So I break these walls and hold my head up high. assembled the cruciform tail as a separate component as the model was becoming rather bulky at this stage and difficult to position on the workbench. The tail was painted and weathered separately and only attached to the fuselage towards the end of the build. In 1975, the designers of the Tupolev Bureau were given a complicated set of requirements for their new fourth generation strategic bomber. It had to fly higher, faster and further than any aircraft in the world and deliver a devastating arsenal of weaponry to its target. The designers eventually opted for a lifting body configuration where it's not just the wings which provide the lift but the fuselage as well. The other benefits of that shape were lots of room for fuel, a reduced visibility to radar and infrared, and more efficient use of the airflow around the aircraft. Variable sweep back wings added further flexibility to the flight performance. The Tupolev Tu-160 White Swan eventually entered active service in the then Soviet Union in 1987. The TU-160's power plant consists of four Samara NK321 afterburning turbofan engines. The aircraft has a maximum takeoff weight of 275 tons and a maximum speed of more than 2000 km per hour. It has a practical range of more than 12,000 km, which is almost a third of the circumference of the Earth and a service ceiling of 16,000 meters. The TU-160 has a length of 54 meters, just 3 meters short of the American Valkyrie, and a wingspan of almost 56 meters with wings spread forward at 20 degrees, and more than 35 meters with wings swept back at 65 degrees. The main materials of the airframe are titanium, heat-treated aluminium alloys, steel alloys and composite materials. The TU-160 has two internal weapons bays, which make it capable of carrying a total of 45 tons of ordnance.
As mentioned before, the recessed panel lines and surface features are very shallow on this model, and I wanted to preserve as much of these details as possible. For this reason, I opted to use Mr. Color enamel-based paints, as these adhere directly to the surface of the plastic model, without the need of an initial base coat. This way, there was one whole layer less of paint to clog up those precious surface details. I pre-shaded the whole model with a dark grey, picking out the deeper panel lines and a few small areas which looked important. By adding a leveling thinner to the mix, I could sparingly apply thin layers of white paint and still get fairly good coverage. I tried not to paint in uniform layers, but rather in a more natural broken fashion to achieve a bit of mottling and unevenness to the coat. I had sleepless nights worrying that the model would end up looking more like a set of Vegas veneers than a scaled down aircraft. Once again, I placed a lot of emphasis on thin, gradual layers and managed to retain most of the finer surface details for later washes and weathering. The decals included with the model were excellent. They were bright and colorful and easy to apply. I even managed to lay down all of the larger ones without a single tear or fold. I painted the inner parts of the tires silver and added an oil wash to enhance their details. The rubber tires provided by the kit were great and looked quite realistic when stretched over their rims. I constructed the rear landing gear and painted all of the small sections. While doing this, I tried to follow reference pictures as close as possible as there were quite a few more colors on the real aircraft than were indicated in the instructions. After a light coat of satin varnish, it was time to remove the paint masks. Gluing in the landing gear was quite an intricate process, as their final resting positions within the model were quite precise and tight-fitting. In this kit, the parts of the landing gear are made of an extremely durable type of plastic, which, combined with a snug fit, made them sturdy enough to easily support the full weight of the aircraft. All of the wheels were added to the landing gear. The great thing about the design of the wheels on this model was that, even after they were glued into place, they were still able to roll. While I was here, I glued the exhaust nozzles into place too. I decided to use oils for weathering the lower part of the fuselage. A color called Starship Filth was applied very sparingly to various areas of the model using a MIG oil brusher applicator. These oils were blended into the surface of the model and any excess was wiped away. 
I used some reference photographs for this part of the process too and tried to follow the weathering patterns as closely as possible although maybe not quite as nasty as some of those pictures. The upper fuselage showed very little weathering in the reference pictures so I didn't do too much more to this part of the model except to add some very light streaking with some more oils. After removing the cockpit protector and fitting the canopy, I realized that the previously clear part looked way too white. It was repainted to match the rest of the aircraft a little more and then glued in using canopy glue. Eventually I was forced to mask off some parts around the canopy and use an airbrush to lightly blend the canopy's color with the rest of the aircraft. The tail was test fitted and finally glued into place. All that was left was to glue in the fragile bits and the last few clear parts. To finish off the build, I carefully removed the canopy masks. This has almost become a ritual at this point because I know that once the canopy masks are off, the build is done. While the TU-160 White Swan is a spectacular example of aviation engineering done right, this exceptional beauty is also highly lethal. The TU-160 can carry a total of 12 Reduga KH-55 cruise missiles, 6 in each of its launch bays, and these have a range of 2,500 kilometers. Alternatively, it can carry 24 Reduga KH-15 short-range nuclear missiles with an operational range of around 300 kilometers. However, it gets even scarier. It has recently been announced that the aircraft has allegedly been modified and is currently able to carry the KH-47 M2 Kinzhal missiles, known as Dagger or Killjoy because of their hypersonic nuclear capabilities. With a range of over 2,000 kilometers, they are capable of hitting potential targets across Ukraine and beyond. According to Russia, the Kinzhal missile reaches speeds high enough to blast through reinforced defenses and it can be loaded with either a high explosive fragmentation warhead or a 500 kiloton hill nuclear warhead. It's not over until it's over. And in the end, we all lose. So long, and thank you for watching. I don't know what you want. Let's have a bit of fun till I downfall. My love, if you feel like I do right now, don't say you're on the road.
my love if you feel like I do right now Don't say you're on the run to the other side, my love 